Okay, we are going live. And we are now live. Welcome everybody to the Critical Blast podcast. I'm RJ Carter, Senior Managing Editor here at criticalblast.com. And with me today, I have Johnny Harvey. Uh, Johnny is the grandnephew of Alfred, who was the founder and publisher of Harvey Comics. Now, I know you're a bunch of superhero geeks out here normally, but comic books would not be a thriving industry that they were if it were not for those cute little Harvey kids and <laughs> the, um, army guys that were running around. So, yeah, you know, we, we owe a great debt of uh, great debt of gratitude to Alfred and, um, and company. So, Johnny, you are the producer of a documentary about the Harvey comics industry called Ghost Empire. What in, that, what in general is that about? And then we'll dig into it for uh, some more details. Well, essentially, um, I mean, I, ever since I graduated college, it was, uh, it was May of 2017, um, you know, I came out of college with a marketing degree and a lot of journalism experience. And, you know, I decided, you know, to make a documentary about this family business that I didn't really know about because my grandfather had died before I was born. So I started asking a lot of the people that were alive from those days to tell me about their experience at the company. And then I talked to historians that had done research and talked to people that, you know, have since passed away and realized that there was an amazing story that's been untold about the documentary or about the Harvey Comics rather. And so I decided to really double down and, uh, go on this journey of discovering what happened to Harvey and documenting it for the world to see. That, you know, that's a great question too, is what did happen to Harvey? Because there were so many titles out there uh, and it was such a rich, um, I mean, it was, it was all kids comics, but you know, you had your rich kid, funny stuff. You had your ghosts, you had devils and witches, the very kind of a cult <laughs> line for there for a little while, but you had your other stuff too. Um, yeah. Did you get any information on, what inspired uh, these particular characters? I mean, well, let, let's start with who came first. Uh, uh, how, what was the first creation or acquisition that Harvey had that turned them into a publishing empire? Well, it's interesting. My grand uncle, Alfred, was kind of the visionary. He had spent some time in uh, Fox Comics, and for all the historians and comic book buffs, they'll know that that was kind of where Joe Simon and Jack Kirby kind of got their start. And Fox was kind of a notorious businessman. And, you know, he would really treat people like just kind of like the scum of the earth, you know, just take advantage of these, you know, kids that couldn't find work anywhere else because they were, you know, sons of Jewish immigrants. Um, you know, they, a lot of Jewish immigrants, they couldn't really find work and reputable jobs. Like at the time, journalism was really reputable and advertising. And, you know, these companies just wouldn't hire them in, in the 1930s America, which is hard really to believe, but um, it happened. And so Alfred was working there and met Joe Simon. And Joe Simon and him kind of teamed up secretly because Joe was starting to work for a company that, uh, it's now known as Marvel, but was known as Timely in comics at the time. And uh, so Joe was secretly working for Alfred because he didn't want uh, his company and his publisher to find out that he was kind of working for the other guy. But Joe and him started kind of just doing things. And, and Alfred left Fox Comics thinking he could kind of do what Fox was doing, maybe a little bit nicer, maybe a little bit, um, you know, savvier. Um, and he got some funding by a guy named Irvin Mayheimer and had started with uh, publishing, I believe it was Speed and Champ first, and then, uh, which he didn't start, but they had all these, you know, I, yeah, I kind of get it mixed up which one was had which characters, but um, they had all these superheroes from uh, World War II that they were doing in there, and then they started a couple different things called Pocket, and I believe it was Spitfire came from that. Um, and in Pocket, they started with this amazing character called Black Cat, which I know a lot of comic book uh, fans know out there. And she was, you know, a stunt actor by day and a, you know, crime fighting uh, superhero by night. She would beat up the bad guys. Now, that now was this so, under a banner of Harvey Comics? Um, it was 
under these different lines. It was under Speed, Champ, Spitfire, and Pocket, but it was all under the Harvey imprint. But I don't think it was until okay. 1945-ish that they actually adopted the name Harvey, though, or at least branding-wise. I think at first, the cell was the characters, the cell was the comic line, and then eventually, as they kind of started to put their name on it, people started realizing, oh, that's a Harvey comic. Um, but at first, they weren't doing the Harvey comics that you and I know of Harvey now. They weren't doing Casper. They weren't doing Little Audrey and Hot Stuff and Richie Rich. They were doing some of the goriest, some of the uh, most uncomfortable-looking uh, comics like EC was doing, especially post-war. But during the war, they were doing characters that were patriotic. Uh, they were doing Shot Gibson. They got the rights to license Green Hornet and, you know, they did a lot of comic books based on the Green Hornet defeating the Nazis. Um, and they were doing some really interesting things at the time that you would think, whoa, Harvey was doing that. Um, but it wasn't until the 50s, um, you know, right when uh, Wortham was kind of having his attack on, yeah. on the comic book publishers that they kind of changed things. And Harvey was really in the business of licensing really popular characters. And Alfred, my grand... Uh, my grand uncle, uh, when he went to war with Joe Simon, they went to the Pentagon to create all this amazing um, material for the war effort to essentially uh, be the army's propaganda wing uh, to an extent. But also they were making uh, material to help uh, people learn how to change their rifle or clean the latrines because a lot of people at the war at that time who enlisted were illiterate. And so the best use of, you know, of their time was not to be carrying around novels or instruction manuals, but was to be looking at pamphlets that kind of told them exactly uh, what to do, where to be through the use of pictures, um, but also as a way of entertainment. Power of sequential art. Exactly. And so Alfred made a lot of connections at the Pentagon because there were a lot of famous cartoonists, and editors, and writers that all went there. And so while he was away at war, he brought my grandfather in to run the business in New York. Because both of them were a little too old, um, or at least the age back then. You, you would typically be like between 18 and 24 or something like that to be prime for the army. I think they were more like in their late 20s, like 26, 28. And he brought in my grandfather, who had studied art at Pratt uh, in New York, to kind of run the business in his stead. And when he came back, he realized that the company had really grown a lot. Um, the characters that they were doing were very successful and they had a lot of shelf space and he had connections in the war that he started making, uh, contacts with and bringing their characters like George Baker and sad sack, um, into the Harvey fold. He was working with Dick Tracy and, and a lot of other characters that were famous syndicated strips. He would make a deal with King features or sometimes the artists themselves and start licensing them and make deals that were kind of unheard of at the time. You know, a lot of artists and writers or creators of their own characters at the time, they would sign away their rights and they get paid by the page. They wouldn't get paid a lot of money, but Alfred would do these crazy deals that were kind of unheard of. I think because he worked at Fox and he saw that, you know, he could be the kind of boss that takes advantage of people, but he could also be the kind of boss that values his employees and treat them fairly. So he, at times, would make deals that just seemed kind of crazy, like splitting profits 50-50. But, you know, at that time, it was a way for the Harvey brand that was kind of the little engine that could at the time. They weren't the biggest publisher on the market. They were good, but they weren't the biggest publisher by any means. But it was a way for them to get popular characters that everybody knew from the syndicated strips. Because as you know, being a syndicated... Yeah, they made themselves as attractive as possible. Exactly. And to be a syndicated cartoonist at the time was like the holy grail. It was like you've hit the jackpot. You were a rock star. Everybody knew Outcap. Everybody knew Milton Kniff. And these people were working for Harvey or at least licensing their characters to Harvey, uh, like Little Abner and uh, a handful of other characters that like Terry and the Pirates that everybody knew and loved from the strips. And then all of a sudden there's a, you know, 64 page, uh, 36 page pamphlet on you know the character and they don't have to wait for the next strip to come out and that was kind of a new thing that harvey really did a good job at and soon after they kind of fell into the paramount uh characters which is a whole other story 
Now that that leads me to uh, asking a question about the characters themselves. Were was everything that uh, Harvey Comics did licensed from someone else, or did they need the characters, um, or, or was it a, a sort of a mix? Um, well, I think that originally it really was a mix. Um, I think more so on the licensing side. But they had started working with Paramount characters um, in the 50s. Um, essentially, Paramount was in a situation where they were needing to divest their assets. Um, there was a big antitrust um, antitrust was really being challenged in the country and Paramount was subject to a lot of attention from it. They weren't the only people that dominated the market, but they were, you know, essentially they were dominating distribution, creation, and uh, pretty much everything to do with everything in the country from actually putting it in their theaters um, to being able to get it on TV was starting to happen. They had full control of that. And the government was felt like that was a little too uh, much. And so Paramount thought, okay, we need to figure out something to do with these characters because TV is coming in and we need to figure out who's, you know, how we're going to get these characters on TV because we can, you know, see that it's going to be very profitable. And Harvey had been licensing Casper and little Audrey. Casper was not a very big character at the time. It was kind of just a sad little ghost looking for a friend. You know, it wasn't really, what we know of Casper today is kind of a problem solver as kind of a right. superhero. And Audrey was huge though. Baby Huey was pretty big. And Harvey had kind of started making those characters what they were in the comic books. A lot of the Paramount animators were moonlighting for Harvey and working on those books there. But Harvey was kind of a natural fit. But while they were working on those Paramount characters, they were actually creating a lot of characters uh, themselves within the books. So you know, the editor likes to joke, the old editor, Sid Jacobson, likes to joke that my grandfather um, you know, and, and Alfred yelled at him one day because they were trying to buy these characters from Paramount. And they were like, why did you create all these characters? Why did you create Wendy? Why did you create Spooky? You know, now we have to pay more for these characters. And uh, it was kind of a funny, you know, you laugh at it, you know, now, but at the time it was kind of a big deal because they created all these characters that they didn't own the rights to. But long story short, Harvey got those characters, and it, it you know they they owned them. They were able to merchandise them and put them on TV, and they were able to use Paramount to animate those cartoons under the Harvey direction. So it was kind of a win-win. Um, and then they created Richie Rich, which was of course a creation of comic books. It wasn't like a TV show beforehand. It was their creation. And it was a similar character to Casper in a sense, but it had its own, of course, um, you know, it created its own phenomenon in a way that, you know, kind of Spider-Man did, where it was a creation of the medium, as Jerry Beck likes to say. Um, yeah, so, now there was a, but there was a definite house style to uh, yeah. to the Harvey comics, uh, because if you look at Richie Rich and you look at Hot Stuff and you look at Casper, you know, they're, they're all the same size. They're all the same um you know, th their bodies are congruent with each other. There's the same head shape, basic uh, jawline and everything. And and, and that they, they all inhabited the same universe, even though you barely ever saw them together. Uh, some of my favorite uh, reading material when I was younger was where Richie, Rich and Casper would meet each other. Of course, Richie always thought, oh, I'm having a dream again because there's Casper. Often do, I don't know if it was in Richie, Rich Mysteries or uh, a Vault of Mysteries, but it was, it, it was always a special yeah. event whenever it happened. Yeah, crossover events, you mean? Yeah, yeah, way before crisis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that there was a style that one artist in particular, Warren Kremer, kind of championed, and he had this belief that Harvey shared and the artist shared that you know there should be a house style. Every character should really have that same look. I mean, I've seen conspiracy theories that. Uh, you know, Casper is really the dead Richie Rich. Um, oh, gosh. That's just, yeah, that's a real theory. You can go out there and check it out. But in reality, it was just, you know, Warren had a style to draw the heads the exact same way. And, I mean, if you look at those two characters from, you know, the 60s, especially, they, are, they have the exact same head. They have the exact same eyes. 
the exact same nose, the exact same dimensions. And you're thinking like, what? I mean, are these the same characters? But of course they're not. Um, but that was the style that they did. And, you know, the Harveys, they didn't really want to put uh, art, uh, artist credit or writer credit on their work because they wanted everything to fall under the Harvey umbrella. And so a lot of these artists that were incredible, like Warren Kramer, Ernie uh, Colin, Steve Mufati, who came from Paramount, <clears throat> a lot of different artists, writers, they just didn't get the credit um, that a lot of these people in the 60s at Marvel were getting, um, you know, unless they were a really big name syndicated strip artist or writer, um, they would put those credits because it was a selling tactic. George Baker got a credit on his stuff because he was known as, you know, George Baker's dad sack. Um, but, you know, there was Harveyville and these characters kind of, uh, they were able to hang out on uh, on the block and there was a lot of crossover stuff. Richie and, you know, Casper were, you know, big plugs for the uh, Boy Scouts and National Baseball League and all these different sponsorships where these good characters were yeah, perfect. Richie Rich sold grit just like I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that, you know, in general, there was a Harvey style. You saw Harvey comic you knew it was a Harvey comic, you know, sometimes without even seeing the Harvey logo on it. Now, how, how long did the Harvey line run? I mean, I'm, I recall still seeing, I don't know if they were, did they go out of press and then were like on hiatus for a while and then came back? Because I know I've seen recent issues. And when I say recent, you know, I'm 52 years old, recent anytime in the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, Harvey started in 1939. And it didn't adopt the name of Harvey uh, until like about, again, like 1945, maybe a little earlier, maybe 46. Um, before then, they were kind of, they started with different names. They were like family comics or home comics. There was different, um, you know, they had different names of, of, you know, trying to really like get that family feel because they wanted to be known as, you know, a family comic book, even though that they were doing this crazy horror stuff. My family the company went out of business. I think it was 83 that they stopped publishing. Okay. I think it might have been 82. It was 82 actually, I believe. And then they went on a three year hiatus because they were dealing with some internal um, issues, which we're going to highlight in the doc. And they came back in 86 for about three years, but it was kind of a little too, little too late to an extent. The comic book market had changed a lot. Of course, as you know, from mid to late seventies through the eighties, comic book stores yeah. started to come into proliferation, but they weren't really a big deal at the time. They were kind of niche and, and they were for an older crowd. You know, of course, uh, you know, kids in, in the cities were able to just to walk home from school and they'd find all these comics on their newsstand um, or at a candy store. And people had moved out to the suburbs at that point. So it was more difficult for kids, you know, ages four to 10, four to 12 maybe to get a hand in these comics and the comic book stores were really for a mature audience. So it was hard to get shelf space on, uh, you know, at these comic book stores. So my family sold the company in 1989 to an entrepreneur out in Los Angeles. He created the 1995 Spielberg movie, had a short run printing comics, um, all the Harvey comics, but they were, they did licensing again with, you know, I don't know if you remember Saved by the Bell or New Kids on the yeah. Block. They were huge comics sure. in the early 90s, um, you know, based off of obviously the boy band and the show. Um, but they were licensing the Flintstones and all the Hanna-Barbera comics. I mean, they had made a real big run on things. They were starting to do some more, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say experimental, but experimental stuff like they did a, a, a comic book called Frank, I believe. And it was kind of a Frankenstein take. They were really pushing oh, yeah. the envelope and they essentially imported um, or transported the old Harvey operation, same editors, same writers, same artists, and just moved them to LA or to an extent were able to work remotely and send in their work. So it was interesting because Harvey, you know, was still Harvey, but it wasn't ran by the Harvey brothers. And then Harvey Entertainment, Harvey Comics Entertainment, which was 
what it was rebranded to. Ended up selling in, I think, 2003 to uh, Classic Media. And then Classic was owned, got bought by DreamWorks. DreamWorks is owned by Universal, which merged with uh, uh, with NBC, which is owned by Comcast. So Harvey now. Which is, puts us all nope. back in antitrust territory. <laughs> it all comes back around, right? You know, I mean, back in the '50s, that wouldn't have flown, but today is a different world. Um, but Harvey has kind of a new life. They've they the characters are being printed not very regularly, but maybe like quarterly by a group called American Mythology, and they're doing reprints of the characters and then kind of a new take on some of the characters. You can see them in comic book stores in the kids section. You don't do a lot of them, but they, you know, they're on the shelves. There's a show on Netflix called Harvey Girls Forever, which kind of features the main Harvey Girls, Little Audrey, Little Dot, and Little Lotta. And it's kind of a new take on them. They've redesigned the character's design, and, you know, they've tried to kind of create a world that is more representative of today's world. Um, sure. And they've incorporated some of the Harvey characters in the shows as kind of cameos, little crossover stuff, but in their own take. Um, and being a writer sorry. myself, uh, I've always be, being a writer myself. I've, I've toyed with the idea frequently of what it would be like to submit a script to Harvey uh, for an experimental kind of book with those characters, but taking uh, you know Dorothy Polka and Carlotta Plump and uh, Audrey <laughs> Smith, and and having them be in their mid to late twenties, uh, mm. and and working for Richie Rich in something like uh, Harvey's Angels. <laughs> yeah, that would be very have their quirks, like that. but you know, being adventure. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. I think that I think that all the Harvey characters, even though they were kids, you know, in in the comics, they, you know, the idea of them as an adult um, is oh, you've seen the Ender Dog comics? That's great. Um, uh, yeah, they did those in the nineties. Um, they were pretty popular, I believe. Um, but all those characters, you can kind of see there's a way to kind of mature them. Like, what what if Richie today was in college? How would he deal with that? Um, you know, what if Richie was old enough to run for president? You know, what would that comic book be like? And I think the Harvey's did a great job. <laughs> well, of I think having, we've seen that. <laughs> well, I don't know if Richie would act the same way as uh, our friend. Yeah, I know, I know. House. We're, I we're think, just taking the I, richest guy we can think of with blonde hair and... Yeah, I think that it's um, it'd be more interesting to know if Donald Trump didn't read Richie um, than if he did read Richie, because um, of course Richie uses his wealth to solve people's problems um, and do good, which was the Harvey motto. Um, well, he had money, I, you know, in everything. He could he he had money pouring out of tea pitchers and and what have you. Right. And I think the the coolest thing I learned uh, math wise was from a, a single page Richie Rich story where uh, he and his, his you know, evil cousin, Reginald Van Doe, uh, were, were walking down the street together and there's this street there. And, uh, and Reggie's like, you know, I'm not giving you anything, you know, go get a job. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Richie's like, here's a penny. If you're here tomorrow, I'll give you, I'll double that. And Reggie's laughing it off and he's like, what, what kind of a, well, you're a big spender, aren't you? And he comes back the next day, here's two pennies. He comes back the next day, here's four pennies. <laughs> and then as 30s later, he's like, you know, here's 23 million 750,000. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't work. And I get my calculator out and I'm like, holy crap, that's a good deal. <laughs> yeah, I think Harvey did a good job also of like doing dream sequences of Richie, you know, um, which were, was able to kind of show him in these strange situations that you know, in the regular world wouldn't happen, but it was always a fear of, you know, disappointing his father or fear of losing money or fear of um, just making a silly decision that like ruins a dinner party that they had or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, and you had the repeating tropes of like uh, the return of the 24 hour dropsies uh, where nobody could yeah. hold on to anything. You just kept dropping everything. <laughs> and of course, one of my favorites being uh, super Richie and Cadbury when they put on superhero mm -hmm. costumes to go out and fight something. I was told a story because in the 80s, Harvey, um, a lot of entities wanted to buy Harvey because Harvey wasn't doing well. And Marvel in particular, they were concerned that with Harvey out of the market, that it was going to disrupt everything. Because if you were a comic book reader like yourself, you probably started with Harvey 
Um, yeah. I don't know about you personally, but that was where kids started. And then they would graduate into more mature things like Marvel, DC. Um, girls oftentimes graduated to the Archie comics. And Marvel wanted to buy Harvey. And it was essentially a done deal where they had brought the writers, artists from Harvey. They were coming to Marvel. They were starting to plan what they were going to do. And they were going to create, you know, the comic book where it's uh, explaining where has Richie been? He's been off the shelf for all this time. Where has he been? One of the ideas that was thrown around was that Richie was Spider-Man and he was creating Spider-Man's suit. And they were planning this whole thing, which would have been a very fascinating, you know, modern take on Richie. If Richie was, you know, the Iron Man equivalent, but he was his buddy, maybe like a year or two younger or the same age. I and mean, I think there's the opportunity for that, but it would have been kind of fun to see that crossover, no? <laughs> yeah, bring them, bring them into the Marvel Universe, um, particularly <laughs> now with Marvel making money hand over fist with uh, the MCU films. Yeah, that would be nice. So... What, what ultimately did, I mean, the, the, the term ghost empire for, for your documentary, mm -hmm. that definitely has a double double meaning to me uh, because yeah. <laughs> first of all, obviously this is a comics empire that was built on a ghost, on, on Casper the Friendly Ghost, so to speak, uh, even though there were plenty of priors. And then secondly, of course, is that, you know, it, it brings about, the, it evokes the sadness that it was an empire that's no longer here. So it, it's a ghost of an empire now because we don't have all the Harvey comics on the stands, uh, even though Harvey exists still in a fashion. Um, and, I, and I'm assuming that it still exists in a way that it's drawing in royalties from any film work or any of the uh, animation going on with uh, Paramount. Mm -hmm. Or has that been all sold off? Your question is where are the properties now or your. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, well, like I said, it was, you know, kind of bought up and bought up and bought up by different entities. And so now they're like kind of a tiny little dot within the MC Universal um, conglomerate. Um, but Harvey, you know, the, I mean, the name Ghost Empire, of course, they became a massive, massive media empire riding Casper. And, and you know, Richie kind of took the mantle especially in the late 60s, 70s. But I mean, Casper was a sponsor for a lot of different entities for, uh, for like I said earlier, you know, National Baseball League, Boy Scouts, UNICEF, the Dentist Association. When you walked into the dentist as a kid in the 60s, Casper was there smiling at you with a toothbrush, a very welcoming face if you don't, you know, yeah. if you don't go into the dentist. <laughs> And I mean, Casper was sponsored, you know, by NASA at one point, you know, NASA named the control module of Apollo 16 uh, Casper. And they did a huge promotion with Casper flying to the moon in their comic books. And, um, you know, they wrote music about it. And I mean, they merchandised with Mattel and they made a lot of money. But, you know, they made their money with Casper. But then at the same time, you know, as the markets changed and the family didn't really see um, or really prioritize kind of changing, um, you know, their business model or moving with the times, they were too busy fighting with each other um, as the industry was quickly just dramatically changing and the way kids bought comics was just dramatically changing that, you know, they were able to kind of ride with Casper, but then all they just all of a sudden kind of fizzled. They just all of a sudden it was where is Harvey? It was like it was like they disappeared um like a ghost. So they had a little resurgence, but then it kind of happened again. Where they just all of a sudden after the Spielberg movie, they did a couple other little things. And then you just start asking in the 21st century, where is Harvey? Where's Casper? Right. Where's Richie? And they've done a few things, but nowhere near the level um, and the mass scale that they were doing it in the 60s, 50s, 70s, and, you know, to an extent, a little bit in the 80s. Um, yeah, so I, that's kind I of remember the, the Casper movies. 
I, yeah. I remember the Casper movies. I liked the Casper movies. Um, and I, there's been more than even two of them. I think some of them have gone direct to DVD. Uh, the Richie Rich movie didn't seem to uh, take off as well. That was Macaulay Culkin, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it was very I popular. What there was about that, but it. Yeah, it was very popular to an extent. I mean, there's a lot of kids my age and 10 years older than me grew up with that movie and remember Richie Rich. You know, when they think of Richie Rich, they think of Macaulay Culkin. But, you know, that movie, the rights were sold before my family actually had sold the company. So that movie was kind of in association with the new Harvey, but run by some a, a different entity. And so, yeah. you know, I'm not sure it would have been as successful as it could have been. And a lot of people criticize maybe the movie because uh, Richie Rich is supposed to be like 10 years old ish. And Macaulay was, you know, they kept delaying production and delaying production and delaying production. And he was the perfect person to play the character, but he kept getting older. And to me, yeah, I think they did. Stop that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the curse of a child actor, I guess. Um, but, you know, they had an issue where they just you know, kind of against the clock with age. And I think they did a pretty good job of making him seem younger than he was. But I don't think that it had the effect, especially that Casper did, where it was the number one movie in the world and had incredible box office numbers. And they did incredibly well with merchandising and DVD sales or VHS sales at the time in 1995, which was kind of a new thing. And it kind of changed the entire market of like how kids saw movies and saw their characters. So, I mean, Casper, the Casper movie compared to the Richie movie, which happened, uh, Richie happened in 94, Casper happened in 95. Um, it's like no comparison. Um, I mean, Casper yeah. was massive and, and the way that, you know, millennials will see Casper is through that movie. It's not through how obviously you experienced Casper on the shelves. It, there's a, there's a huge surgence in, um, uh pop culture nostalgia, it, it comes around every so often. Uh, and it's, and it's here again today. I, I think it's a shame that, you know, the Harvey characters have been, you know, sold out of the family now uh, because I could definitely see like a line of uh, Funko pops uh, of the <laughs> Harvey character. <laughs> they wouldn't even look like they were Funko pop. They would look like just plastic replicas of the characters, I think. Uh, <laughs> but th there should definitely be a line of, you know, Casper and Spooky and uh, his Goyal Poyle and uh, Gloria Glad, Freckles and Pee Wee. Uh, all of those guys would, would look great on a shelf done up in that plastic vinyl thing. Uh, but I guess if somebody wants to license anything like that now, they've, they've, they've got to go to uh, Paramount Universal, whomever uh, is controlling whatever character now. Yeah, I think that, you know, when you think about what big companies are trying to sell their stakeholders, you know, I'm not going to speak for NBCU, but you know, I think that they have had trouble reaching the audience that the Harveys were really great at um, reaching. Um, and you know, family has kind of held on to some um, character rights, like yeah, you know, my my relatives they own the Black Cat and a lot of the pre-code comic books, those superheroes that were in the '40s, um, but they haven't. Uh, been able to have success with those characters because it's, as I understand, really difficult for a, you know, someone that's not Marvel, someone that's not DC, someone that, you know, that isn't one of these big entities to get shelf space. But it's a shame because well, you Black Cat in particular would be an amazing... Oh, we froze up there. Um, you, you know who's doing incredibly well with uh, characters of that era and and to tell you the truth, I'm kind of surprised that your family still has the rights to them because so many of the characters from that time have just lapsed into public domain. Uh, but Dynamite Comics is doing a uh, dynamite job, no pun intended, uh, with all that uh, cadre of characters like the Black Terror, the Green Llama, um, mm. with their Project Superhero. And it's all just this, it, it's like the Justice League of public domain. And they're just <laughs> putting title after title after title out with these. So. You, know, you might want to um, you know, knock on there and say, hey, uh, we've got these characters. You've got this audience already built in. Uh, let's let's do something here, because the people who are reading those books, uh, you know, half of them are being introduced to the characters for the first time. And, you know, yeah. a good portion of them are like, all oh, right. I remember reading these when I was just, you know, knee high to a grasshopper and they're back again. 
Yeah, and I just spent I 100% agree. Um, I think all those characters, I think everybody would be like, whoa, Shock Gibson, what's going on there? Um, but ultimately, that's, you know, it's not my decision. But I'll take I'll, I'll take your word, and I will tell them that you say that we gotta <laughs> we gotta fix this because people want these characters, and I personally want Black Cat. They do. Right? I think that you know she would make an incredible um, archetype for a movie today. Um, you know anything dealing well, with Hollywood. The thing and- is, yeah the, the the trouble I could the trouble I could see all, all those public domain characters I listed. Uh, one of the characters they had was named uh, Daredevil, and he threw boomerangs and you know had these street kids that helped him fight on the streets, and they can't use that so. They have to call it the devil. Um, Marvel Comics having a black cat character in the Spider-Man. Yeah, you can see where odd, there might but, be a little yeah. bit of a snaggle things out here. There, would, but, there but I still maybe, think something could be done. There, they, there's always a deal. There's always a deal. Exactly. Tell us a little, little bit more about the documentary. About, about the documentary, when, when uh, people can see it, where they can see it. Sure. Well, we're still in production. Um, we filmed 28 people um, on camera so far. Um, you know, historians like Danny Fingeroth, who just wrote the Stan Lee biography, Jerry Beck, who's a big animation historian, Tom DeFalco, who is a former editor in chief at Marvel, um, Paul yeah. Levitz, former president editor at uh, DC, um, and a lot of family members to really try to get the like, and, and artists and former Harvey employees to really try to get that holistic view of not only Harvey, but you know, the, the comic book industry as a whole and how Harvey was kind of there through all of it. They, you know, of course were part of what I like to call the comic book godfathers, you know, the people that were, that founded the comic book magazine association of America and started the comic code and, and, and we're setting precedent, you know, at the dawn of comic books. And so we filmed yeah. everybody. We've, we've been working with our story and we just brought on a new producer um, who you may know, Patrick Meany. And Patrick has done comic book documentaries like The Image Revolution. He just did Neil Gaiman's um, documentary. And she makes comics and a lot of different comic book documentaries that kind of uh, like Chris Claremont's. uh, I think he did a couple docs involving Chris Claremont. Um, So we're working with him to kind of really get this uh, in the right place where we want it to be and, and get the story where we want it to be and um, it's been it's been great so far. Excellent. Uh, is this going to get uh, you know? Do you do you know where it might be playing? I mean, I'm assuming it's not going to be you know wide release kind of thing. These things generally aren't. Uh, but <laughs> you know, like you're gonna have some convention some conventions planned where you're gonna be doing some screenings and uh, get some DVD sales going. Well, I will be at New Orleans Wizard World. Um, the first week of January promoting the doc, but I can't tell you right now anything about where it might be. We're still in production mode and, you know, knock on wood, you know, I wouldn't want to say anything that, uh, you know, uh, puts us in an awkward situation, but absolutely, absolutely. I will tell you when I'm allowed or able to tell you where this doc is, because I think it's going to be something that comic book fans are really going to love. But I think that a lot of just general baby boomers of, your generation maybe that experienced Casper or experienced comics in a way that a lot of Americans did that this new age of comic book fandom um, also did, but not, it's not exclusive to them. You know, and of course Harvey started in the thirties and we're going to really discuss the inception of comic books, but they're still an entity today. So it's 80 years of history and what was happening in America, you know, in media at the time, they were right there in the middle of it. And I think it's going to be a story that invites a lot of different demographics. And so we're really excited to see just, you know, the audience that uh, this doc is going to give. Well, we're definitely going to be excited to see that, that uh, because we are. Uh, for those uh, tuning in, we are talking with Johnny Harvey, the grand nephew of Alfred Harvey, founder of Harvey Comics, publishers of Casper the Friendly Ghost, Richie Rich, and a host of other titles. Uh, and he has this documentary coming out called Ghost Empire, detailing all that, which he's been talking about just now. Uh, so you want to keep your eyes peeled for that. Harvey Comics is definitely an important chapter uh, in comic books. And as you said, they were 
involved in um, helping set up the CCA. And, and as much as people, you know, revile the CCA at some times, uh, I, I have to say that, you know, the CCA is what saved the comic book industry so that we actually have one. Uh, if they hadn't done that, uh, then, you know, you wouldn't have the superhero titles that you have today of survival at the time. Yeah, so, I mean, it's fascinating. Know, thank your family for participating in that for me. <laughs> I, I can do that. Um, it's, it was interesting because I didn't realize, you know, my, my grandfather was the treasurer of that association. I mean, they were, you know, Dell Comics were licensing the Disney books and they refused to yeah. be a part of this association because they thought, you know, we are Dis we're doing Disney. We're not doing anything out there. You know, you guys can make your own rules. But, you know, there was some real heavy fire, you know, for these comic book entities uh, to an extent where they really needed to figure out a way to keep it going. And so the big four entities, you know, they really band together and they created the comic code, you know, kind of a self-governing body to just make sure that they were all keeping each other in check. And, um, you know, they were able to, you know, then pivot to these, you know, family friendly characters like Casper. And then they created Richie, of course, and, you know, the little Audrey's and, and, and I think that, you know, kids across America kind of would see themselves a little bit in these characters. You know, I think that they were characters that anybody really could relate to, which was, you know, it's pretty inspiring to, to an extent. Um, hopefully you'll Absolutely. be at Heroes Con in Charlotte. Um, send me the info. Maybe I can get there. Um, that'd be great. All right. Well, that's pretty much all the questions I have. Uh, if there's anything I haven't touched on that you feel is important that you want to get out here in front of everybody, uh, now is the good time to do that. Sure. I mean, you guys can check us out at storystreetproductions.com. You can check out our trailer, a uh, little teaser that's there. Um, more official trailers, of course, will be coming as uh, the doc is uh, getting out there. Um, but when we have a release date and when we're ready to do full publicity. I'd love to come back and let everybody know uh, just where that's going to be uh, found. So thank you for having me on the show today. For being here with us, and uh, we'll talk with you again, hopefully, uh, next year when the product is out, and we will can dig into it deeper. I would love that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for, for being here. Good night. Thank you. Good night.